Right now, a friend of the show and a friend of mine from TSN, Jason DeVos. Jason, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Anthony. How are you tonight? Very good. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for making time to join us, Jason. Let's preview the 2016 season about to get underway in a couple of weeks or less. Let's start with the Canadian clubs first. Let's talk about Vancouver, who has been real busy the last couple of weeks. I like what they've done. I think they're going to be a dangerous, dangerous team to get all the way to the final. Your thoughts on Carl Robinson and this squad? Yeah, I really like a lot of the business that Carl's done this off season. I think they've strengthened in key positions. They've added goals in their team as well. It's not that they've added a single source of goals, because I don't think any of the additions they've made is going to hit 15 to 20 goals each. But I do think that cumulatively, the likes of Masato Kudo, Blas Perez, Christian Bolaños, will be able to add somewhere between 10 and 15 goals together. So I think that's a big, a big bonus for the White Cows because. Supplementary scoring was a, a bit of an issue for them last season at times, and I think that they've really made themselves deeper in a lot of ways this year. So I like a lot of the business they've done. Uh, obviously losing Gershon Kofi to the New England Revolution was a bit of a blow, but like Robinson, I, I kind of feel like Kofi has kind of come to a plateau in his career in the Whitecaps jersey, and it's probably better for his career development as well that he moves on to a new challenge. So. And that frees up an opportunity for some of the younger players to come up and, and maybe stake a claim for a place in the lineup. The likes of Kian Sproz has had a very good uh, preseason so far. Russell Tybert obviously looking for more minutes this year than last. And then Davey Flores has just been signed to a new long-term contract. So there's definitely some upside there. I, I think that the Whitecaps are going to be one of the teams to watch in the Western Conference, although it's a difficult conference. The LA Galaxy have strengthened and made themselves much better again with some, some key additions, but uh, I think it's going to be tough this year for the Whitecaps, but I expect them to be one of the challengers for the top three place in the West. Has Darren Maddox uh, run out his time in Vancouver? Is he off to China, you think? Uh, China's a possibility. There, there could be other suitors. I know he's had some admiring glances from Europe as well. Uh, I'd be surprised if Darren Maddox takes the field in the Whitecaps jersey this year simply because he's another player that uh, you know, needs to move on, I think, to progress in his career. It hasn't worked for Darren in Vancouver, and he certainly hasn't hit the heights of, of maybe his own ambition in many respects because he, he wants to play at the highest level, he wants to score goals, but it's been difficult for him to, to find regular playing time in Vancouver. So I think he's another one that perhaps is probably better that he moves on, and it also gives the Whitecaps a little bit of salary cap relief, which will help them in the end to try and build a stronger squad as well. Let's talk about the Montreal Impact. I've got a lot of time for Joey Saputo. I think he is the ideal owner in MLS. He puts his money where his mouth is. He cares about the team, the province, and he cares about uh, putting a winner out there for his fans. Didier Drogba coming back. I think they're actually going to go backwards, Jason, this year instead of forwards. I think they've got too many veterans, not enough young, fresh legs in there for a long season. Your thoughts? That's uh, an interesting perspective. Uh, you know, I like Drogba as a player in MLS. I think he's a talisman. He's a leader. Uh, it's not just what he does on the field. It's the, the confidence and the experience that he brings to the dressing room. And when you talk to the individuals uh, who work for the club, Drogba's presence is, is overwhelming in many respects, and I think that that's a good thing for the club because they need to have an identity. They need to have those leaders on the field that can uh, that take them in the right direction. So uh, I think it's a big, big coup for the, for, for the impact to be able to get Drogba to come back. There was obviously a lot of discussion about him being uh, on the way to Chelsea in an assistance role to good hitting, but uh, Drogba chose to, to remain in MLS as a player and, and carry on his playing days, and I think that's a good thing for the in impact. Uh, I like the fact that they've uh, inked uh, Laurent Simon to a long-term deal. He was fantastic for them last season, MLS Defender of the Year, and I think his experience is going to be very important for them. But I'm also really keen to see how Mauro, Mauro Biello develops as a head coach. Obviously, he got the job on an interim basis last season. I thought he did really well, and he certainly put in his time as an apprentice uh, manager and learned the ropes and worked at the club his, almost his entire working life. So. If anyone knows what it means to be a Montreal Impact player, it's Mauro Biello. And I'm looking forward to seeing if he can translate that to success on the pitch. Last three off-seasons, everyone has said TFC has won the off-season. It means real nothing when it comes time for kickoff. Drew Moore, Will Johnson, Clint Irwin, uh, Stephen Betashore, and a Josie Altador in much better shape. I like this team, but I have concern that if Clint Irwin goes down or if he's just uh, tired and not used to playing a ton of games all season long, 
that the proper backup is not there. Going with a youngster could be an issue for me. You, Jason? Yeah, my worry is that, that beyond the first 11, there's not a lot of depth there, and that's a concern for me. You know, I, I like a lot of the business that they've done. I like Stephen Vanishore. He's a great character, a great personality. Uh, he's a good defender. I like Drew Moore for the same reasons, because TFC needed to address their, their defensive weakness, and it's been an ever-present since the inception of the, uh, of the team back in 2007. I think that they've managed to do that, but I, I also think it's really important that they keep those key players fit. So the back four of Betashore, Moore, Perkis, and Morrow in front of Clint Irwin with a midfield of uh, Michael Bradley, Will Johnson, Benoit Sheru, I think that they've got definite potential there. And I think they'll be better than they were last year, which, you know, they finished the season off disappointingly with a, a humiliating loss to Montreal in the playoff play-in game. But I do think that they'll finish higher than sixth in the, in, the, in the conference. If you look at the players they have and the talent they have, if they can come back healthy and they can avoid suspensions and, and injuries this season and uh, keep everybody you know, available for the bulk of the year, I think that they have the talent to, to challenge for top place in the Eastern Conference. And you know, people will suggest that the Eastern Conference is a lot weaker than the West. That's not necessarily true. I, you know, I think that the... The games come thick and fast in MLS, and and everyone's working to improve their squad. And you look at the Columbus crew and what they've done in recent years under Greg Berhalter, you can make positive change very quickly. And I think TFC will look at what Columbus have done under Berhalter and think that with more resources and better resources, they'll be able to do something similar this year. Jason, two cities that have major spotlight on them once again this season. Two cities that I hope, for MLS's sake, they get into the playoffs at least one of the two. Chicago Fire, Philadelphia Union. I don't like either one of their chances. I have a feeling they're both going to struggle and both need a resurrection this year to get into the playoffs. Especially Chicago, where a lot of people have a lot of concerns there. Your thoughts? Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what happens in Chicago. You know, Velko Panos has come in there as a head coach, and he knows the league because he played in the league, but I I do think there's a massive overhaul that needs to happen in Chicago. And and obviously, Panovic, alongside Nelson uh, Nelson Rodriguez, they're doing their their due diligence in trying to make sure that it happens. So uh, if that happens in Chicago, I think that's great. It's a great city, but... You know, there's a lot of discontent there amongst the fans. They're not happy with the direction of the club. They're not happy with what's gone on on the field and what the product has been. Uh, and I think that's got to change. So they're under the microscope for sure. Philadelphia is another one where I think they've really underperformed. Um, you know, they've had the resources to invest in players, and I think they've made some poor signings. And, and really, I think what both clubs have underlined is the importance of scouting and recruitment. If you can get it right, there are some hidden gems out there to find, not just within the North American borders, but outside those borders. And I think you look at Vancouver and the recruitment policy they have there, where they've unearthed a few gems over the years from South and Central America. I think that that's the direction that both Chicago and Philadelphia need to look at to try and find those players, because there's value to be gained in MLS. If you can get value for those players that are not on big tickets, those are oftentimes the players that will bring you the success. And I think that's really where... Chicago and Philadelphia in particular have failed over the years. It's been in scouting and recruitment. Jason, as we close off the MLS page, we look to the Western Conference. I don't think the Portland Timbers can repeat. I'm looking for the LA Galaxy to get to the final once again. I think Bruce Arena is a magician. He gets guys at at their weakest times in their careers, and they have fantastic years. Example for me, Dan Gargan, uh, unbelievable. Uh, Gordon as well, on and on. I believe LA is going to real have a strong Champions League and also an MLS League uh, season this year. Your thoughts? Well, they're certainly one of the favorites, aren't they? I mean, I'd love for someone from the league to explain to me how the LA Galaxy are able to accumulate so many star players and no one else seems to be able to do so. Um, it, it baffles me that they can get the likes of Nigel DeYoung, Ashley Cole, Steven Gerrard, Robbie Keane, Giovanni De Santos, all under the same salary cap. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but... I suppose when the players' uh, union release the salary numbers, we'll have to give them a forensic analysis to find out exactly how they're doing it because it baffles me that they're able to get that many big-name players to come here and play for next to nothing. So 
It's an interesting one. I, I think that they've gone down the tried and tested route. You know, they're, they're bringing in experienced players. Um, you can even add Yelly Van Dam into that mix as, as a player who's played at the highest levels in Europe and, and brings that experience and knowledge. But it'll be interesting to see how it all works for it, for them. You know, Steven Gerrard's getting on a bit. There were question marks about whether he'd come back this year. Uh, there were talks about him possibly calling time on his playing days, but he's back and and uh, will look to be an integral part of what L.A. try and do this year. But, I mean, there's no doubt that Bruce Arena's knowledge and experience is a, is a vast uh, card up the sleeve for the L.A. Galaxy because it always seems to be when it really matters that they come into the, the forefront of the discussion and they hit that run of form when it really matters. So it'll be interesting to see how they fare this year. I'm not as confident as you maybe that they can go all the way because I think injury and suspension and international call-ups could you know, play a bit of a role for them. Uh, but we'll see how it plays out over the course of the season. Uh, looking forward to getting it all started in a couple of weeks. Jason, let's talk about uh, what's been in the news up here in Canada the last uh, few weeks, and that's a new Canadian league hopefully launching in 2018. I had on the CSA president, Victor Montagliani, uh, a few weeks back in 2015, and we talked about this new league supposedly getting the kickoff uh, in the next couple of years, and things were in the early stages. And now it seems like things are getting more and more interesting, and hopefully Canada will get its own league. Where do you stand on this? Do you like it? Do you not like it? And what are the, some of the concerns you have about it? I like the concept. I like the idea of having our own league because the only way that we can really control the number of development environments that are, are there for our young players is to be able to have our own league. Um, you know, I've spoken out quite uh, vocally in the press and, and in my role on TSN, and certainly whenever I've had the opportunity to question Don Garber, the MLS commissioner, about the opportunities for Canadians in MLS, I keep getting rebuffed in many respects because those opportunities simply aren't there. And there's on one hand, there's an argument that we have to do a better job as a nation of developing players that are good enough to play in MLS, which I agree with. But I also think that the rules are skewed in favor of American players. And that's a little bit unfair. Uh, some would say it's a lot unfair. And I think that that needs to be addressed. And the only way that we can really do that is if we control our own destiny and we control our own league. So I think it's a good idea, you know, the devil's always in the details, though, and I think that there are a lot of challenges that we have to overcome before we can consider a Canadian professional soccer league to be viable. And one of those is obviously geography. We're a massive country, and you know the revenue streams that are required to support the travel that goes into playing professional soccer, uh, you know, across a seven, eight, nine month season, uh, they're, they're pretty vast. And I think we have to be able to understand that this league isn't going to be a roaring success right off the bat and it's going to take a long-term commitment from a number of wealthy individuals who are willing to invest in the development of soccer in our country and I know that there are a lot of wealthy individuals out there who love the game uh, and I certainly hope that uh, these are the people that are being lined up to be investors in this league because there's no doubt that we benefit from having a, a professional league in our country you only have to go back to the last time we had a truly professional league in Canada that was coast to coast, which was the old CSL, back in the late 80s and early 90s, and it produced a string of players for our men's national team. And I think we have to get back to that, providing those opportunities for our young players, because it really is during those formative years between 18 and 22 that our youngsters aren't getting enough minutes at the MLS level at the moment. And that's really where the biggest gains are to be made. Well said. I couldn't agree with you more. 100% on your side with everything you said about that. Before we let you go, Jason, a little bit on grassroots for the next couple of minutes, and then we'll let you go. We really appreciate your time. Today, in 2016, in your mind, from what you've seen, from what you've heard, what are still some of the major challenges within youth clubs and, and academies, whether it's in administration, developing, coaching, what are you still seeing and hearing that are some of the roadblocks for clubs and academies today? Uh, I mean, I think for me, the biggest issue, Anthony, is that we still have a very fractured youth soccer community. We haven't really had a uniform plan that's inclusive. In fact, I would say that grassroots soccer in our country has been exclusive more than anything else. You only have to look at you know, the, the situation around high-performance leagues. I mean, the CSA has released its player development pathway, and high-performance youth leagues are a key component of that pathway to get to the highest levels of the game. And yet, we still have, in certain provinces, 
we have organizations who are genuinely high performance in their approach to the development of the game who are being excluded from those opportunities. So what we really need to do is we need to get everybody on the same page and, and working together. And I've said before, I find it hugely ironic that in a game that uh, you know it revolves around teamwork and, and playing as a unit, uh, we, we seem to be unable to do that as a soccer community at the grassroots level. And it really is about education and getting everyone to understand that there's a place for everyone within the development system, but not everyone has to be at every level of the game. So if you talk about the recreational game at the house league level, you know, you need a different skill set to be able to provide that environment to what you probably need to be able to provide a high performance environment. And I think far too many people in our country want to call themselves high performance, but they don't really understand what it means. And there's a fear there, perhaps, that if you're not involved at every level of the game, that somehow your club or your organization is going to go out of business. And nothing could be further from the truth, because the demand for soccer in our country is huge. And everyone loves playing the game at the level that's best suited to their abilities. And just because you, know, you, you aren't at the high performance level doesn't mean you can't have a great experience with the game and fall in love with the game and play it for your entire life. So... It's really about getting everyone who's involved in the delivery of a soccer program to understand that, you know what, we're all in this together. We're all in the business of developing players for our national men's and women's team, and we have to work together to be able to do that. So from my perspective, I'd like to see a lot more inclusion and a lot less exclusion and get everybody on the same page working together. Let me ask you this. Are districts still relevant in 2016? Are they needed, Jason? Uh, from an administrative standpoint, they certainly relieve a lot of the burden on the provinces and the provincial associations. But again, you, know, you talk about the duplication of roles uh, across different levels. There's far too much bureaucracy in our game, and that needs to, needs to change. We really need to get away from creating all of these rules to enforce them so that uh, pe you know, people can be kept in place. What we really need to do is we need to get everybody to understand that, look, we're all in this together. We're all in the business of developing players in our country. And if we're brutally honest with ourselves, we failed as a nation. We failed badly in developing players. And I was fortunate enough to be able to wind my way through a broken development system and get to the national team level. And the same thing is happening now that was happening 30 years ago when I was a kid. Kids are fighting their way through the system, and they're getting to the highest level. It's not by design. It's by chance. And we have to change that because we don't have the professional infrastructure in our country that many other countries around the world have, where the professional clubs are basically running the player development system. We don't have that luxury. We only have three MLS clubs, two NASL clubs, and, and they don't all offer male and female programs. So we've got to really work as governing bodies to be able to provide those environments and work with those clubs and academies who are providing those environments to ensure that more kids are getting that opportunity, not less. And that's a big challenge because we've always had this exclusionary mentality in, our, in soccer in our country, and that has to change, and, and it really only changes through education. So I'm a big believer in that. I'm a big preacher of that, as you know. And really, it's all about getting people to work together as opposed to work against one another. Lastly, very quickly, in the last minute or so, Jason, I think there's so much money being wasted out there. And I feel for some big club uh, presidents out there and academy presidents as well. I think too much money is thrown into fancy uniforms, banquets, wasted money down the drain in certain tournaments, on and on. I think a lot of that money should be put into coaching education, into better fields, better facilities. And also, I'd like you to comment on this. There's a lot of clubs out there, some big, big clubs that have some big, big finances. And I think a lot of them are sitting on that instead of using it to properly build maybe their own little stadium, to have that as their own club facility as well. Your thoughts on those two points and we'll close it out. Yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting perspective. I was fortunate enough to work, as you know, at, at one of the great youth clubs here in, uh, in Oakville. Uh, the Oakville Soccer Club for 18 months as a technical director. And, and I can assure you, there's nobody getting rich off youth soccer. It, it, it really is about trying to provide the right environment for every player and to do so as economically as possible. And while there, are, there may be some clubs that, are, that, that do have a reserve fund in place, 
It really is, you know, a, a case of planning for emergencies and, and planning for expenditures that might not, you know, be, be happening on a regular basis that come out of nowhere. And, and certainly facilities management is one big part of that. So, um, I, you know, I do think that we need to have a set of standards of what it is we're actually trying to provide. And I think there's a wide variance in that. So what you get from one club at a certain level of the game might be completely different from what you get at another club who's operating at the exact same level. So I think the, the move to standards-based leagues is a really important one from my, from my perspective because first what we've had to do is define what high performance is and what that means. And we've done that with the OPDL in Ontario and they've done that with the BCFPL in British Columbia. But there's no definition for what the, the second tier of, of that you know, structure looks like. And for me, you know, if I was to have carte blanche to be able to define what youth soccer should look like in our country, I think there needs to be four levels of play. The first level is the local level, which is house league play, recreational play within your own club. The next level is the district level, which is essentially, uh, you know, house league or recreational play within a district so that there's not that much travel involved. The third level would be the regional level, which is the first step on the competitive ladder, which is competitive play within a region of the province. And then the highest level, obviously, would be your high performance level, which is your province-wide HP league. So... You know, I think that what we have to do is get an understanding of what each of those levels means, what a parent can expect at each of one of those levels, what kind of coach you can expect to be working with your child at that level, because, again, there's wide variance across every province in our country of what each club or academy is delivering. So until we standardize that, I think a lot of parents are kind of feeling their way around in the dark looking for the light switch as to, you know, what's a good program, what's not a good program. And I think as governing bodies, we have a responsibility to define those levels for those parents so that they can understand the system that their kids are getting involved in. Fantastic having you on. Proud Canadian, proud guy that wore the jersey for Canada. Jason Navas of TSN, enjoy the 2016 season. And again, we thank you so much uh, for giving us of your time and talk in MLS and grassroots, my friend. Absolutely, Anthony. Anytime. We'll chat to you soon. Jason Navas at TSN. What a class act. What a true gentleman and a friend of the show. We really appreciate him making time.